Hi, I'm David Moskowitz, and we're here with the CEO of Rigel Pharmaceuticals, Jim Gower. Jim, thanks for being with us this afternoon. Oh, thank you, David. Pleasure to be here. With eight active drugs in development and four products in the clinic, or product candidates, that is, talk to us about the R&D efforts at Rigel. How has the company been so productive over the years? I don't know the answer. Uh, of course, no one in this business ever has. Uh, but we've all been doing it for quite a while, and frankly, I think we don't know how to do anything else. But we do target discovery and novel molecules against it, and have done that for a living ever since the inception of Rosal, originally for Big Pharma, and now we've evolved to the point that um, we've got one drug in phase three, in addition to the ones you mentioned, which is partnering with AstraZeneca and finishing up uh, late this year or early next year, and we own all the rest of them ourselves, so um, it's what we do. and. Uh, we tend to focus, um, as some of us date back to early biotech, on uh, uncovering novel mechanisms and trying to come up with small molecule drugs against those. And most of our targets are in immune cell signaling, and we've got a number of folk that, uh, um, that have been in that area for a number of, number of years. So yeah. just lucky, I suppose. Are there specific disease areas that you're focused on? Not as therapeutic areas. We certainly have preferences, but um, one of the things that we've done, and we were very early in it, but uh, there are a handful of us in, in the industry that do this these days, is focus on intracellular signaling pathways. And um, they lead you where they lead you. Uh, we started off doing um, uh, work and validating the uh, Novartis drug that's now now been used in both uh, transplant and MS and various other things in terms of si sorting through the targets. So we already had a fair amount of experience at, uh, in working with J&J &J and Merck and, and Novartis and Daiichi and a few others along the way. And uh, as with everything in this world, uh, you, uh, you find out more questions and more connections as you go forward. So it's a matter of tracking those down to functional mechanisms that you think might have an impact on diseases that aren't well treated. And it's really that simple and it's really that hard. <laughs> Sounds like a very entrepreneurial approach. Um, Rigel has entered into several major partnerships. Um, can you talk about the more exciting programs or the more advanced programs, including the AstraZeneca candidate for um, rheumatoid arthritis? Yes, I can. Um, our, our drug, Fostamatinib, is just finishing up phase three in a huge trial. Uh, that AstraZeneca is uh, luckily paying for because uh, we couldn't afford it. Uh, but it's uh, the, the pivotal studies alone will have over 1,800 patients. There'll be about 3,000 patient years at filing, uh, over 5,000 uh, by the time you get the, you know, past just the, the placebo control portion of the study, the experience part of it. And that's pretty much what uh, the, uh, the ticket is these days with the FDA and the EMEA for chronic use drugs. And uh, it is uh, actually completely enrolled in the, in the first two pivotals, the bigger ones. The others will be all enrolled um, actually in weeks. And the longest follow-up is on the bone assessment. And that'll be done by the end of this year. And they'll file, they've indicated to their investors uh, third quarter of next year. So it, um, it, um, it's quite far along. And uh, so far so good, but you never know for sure until you, until you get in front of the FDA. So the timing for seeing data from phase three is the third quarter next year? So the, the bone studies will finish up late this year, and uh, that should be the basis for the submission that AstraZeneca has, has indicated that they expect to file in third quarter of next year. And you know, the RA segment is a pretty crowded segment at this point. Uh, even Pfizer has a new drug uh, coming out. Yes, they do. How will Fostamitinib compete in the RA segment? The Pfizer drug uh, and our drug, fostamatinib, are both completely different mechanisms than everything that's been used to date. And the reason that's important is that since the guys at Immunex came up with Embrel in the mid-90s, um, at which point, if you remember, people were still using NSAIDs uh, to treat RA because there was no choice, really. Uh, methotrexate's been a standard for years, but it, it doesn't do much. It does something, but it doesn't do much. And at that point in the mid-90s, there wasn't really much else. With the launch of Embro, which is a type of TNF inhibitor, for the first time, you saw a change in the bone destruction that's a hallmark of that disease, and that just changed the market. Since then, we've had it go from zero, brighter Embro for 
TNF inhibitors and in general DMARDs, NRA, to approaching a $16 billion market uh, today and one that amazingly to everybody in the business and certainly me, continues to grow in terms of new patients at double digits a year, which has ended up with now, I think we're on the fifth TNF inhibitor and a bunch of others, and it seems impossible for them to do less than a billion dollars. Um, part of that is old school. Um, when I was uh, uh, first starting in pharmaceuticals, uh, it seems like every NSAID you came up with, and this is scaled back to $70, uh, whatever, the forecast ought to be $100 million, which at the time was serious money. Um, but uh, now the TNF inhibitors have gotten there, and in part it's the aging of the population. But as to your positioning uh, issue, it's actually looking pretty good for both us and Pfizer because both of these drugs are radically different than the things that have existed before in that they have very different mechanisms of action. All the drugs that exist, whether, um, um, whether the TNF inhibitors of different brands or some of the things that have come more recently, inhibit the actual cytokines, which are the inflammatory molecules that are causing the damage in the, boi uh, the joint and the bones, but they inhibit one at a time. What our drug does is block them all from being produced by the macrophages, which is where they come from, and they do it in a way that causes them to not only work about the same overall, but work better on certain patients. Likewise, the Pfizer molecule is different from ours, and they're both different from the TNF inhibitors. And the standard of care these days with the TNF drugs, which are always first line in RA and have been for 15 years, is you'll try one TNF inhibitor and then cycle perhaps through as many as two, three, or more TNF inhibitors before you'll get to the backup drugs. The reason you do that, even though it makes no sense in medicine if you have choices, because the second use of the same medication is unlikely to show much change, is that the drugs work so much better and faster than the backup drugs. They'll find out from the patient in a week, whereas they won't find out from the backup drugs for a few months sometimes whether they're actually doing any better. The advantage of um, our drug, and uh, from what I've seen from the Pfizer data, the Pfizer drug, they both work in the first week of therapy, same as the anti-TNS. They have different mechanisms. They're both oral. Um, so they make a lot more sense in terms of where you would go in the early treating based on most types of medicine where there are choices. Secondly, there are some specific advantages of our drug in relationship to the bone destruction that's the hallmark of the disease. Sick, which is our target, is involved in the activation of osteoclasts, which are the part of the bone that absorbs damaged bone. Uh, it is hyperactive in most bone diseases. And um, we have seen dramatically different results in every animal model we've ever done, and in humans in the prior trials, including one published in the New England Journal last year. And uh, our partner AstraZeneca has got a rather massive effort of x-rays at all different time points underway with almost 1,800 patients. And if we can eke a differential claim out that satisfies the FDA and the EMEA, um, we, uh, we would be delighted to take that as well into a different, that could be a game changer, obviously. But the data is, uh, is quite strong based on the mechanism, based on biomarkers in human, based on MRI data in human, but always x-rays are the last things to show it up. And the reason we have to do it in x-rays is that has been the basis for the prior DMARC claim, starting with Embrel. So you can't get a comparative claim unless you do the same, the same endpoint, and they take 12 months no matter what you do. So we'll see at the end of this year. So novel mechanism of action. Yes. Um, it's oral. Yes. Versus the standard of care today, which are injectable. Yes. And what about safety? I know safety is a... Is a um, a tough hurdle with these um, autoimmune drugs. You never have a free ride with modulating the immune system. I don't know of an a, a immunomodulatory drug that doesn't have something that is not just sort of your classic pharmaceutical side effect, but some off-target effect, but actually something that goes part and parcel with the mechanism. The TNF inhibitors do, the newer ones will. And we have seen to date a slight increase, luckily in mild, but still there, infections. There's not much of a difference between placebo and treated arms and ours, and, and as I said earlier, 1,100 patient years reported and several published in very big journals, but you can measure it. Luckily, it's all mild, moderate, transitory stuff that comes and goes, and it's only roughly a difference of 14% to 21% a 
control versus active, but it's there. And just like the TNFs and the other drugs in this category, advantage the body for whatever infections are going around, you'll get those things that show up. The interesting news for us, and I don't know that I'm bold enough to predict this as being how it'll end up, but we haven't found a single type of pathogen that's advantaged by the particular pathways that, that our drug activates. Now, um, you know, that may just be something that shows up as a very rare event between patient 3,000 and patient 5,000. We'll see what we see. But at least thus far, uh, we've seen very little uh, that is a particular difference from anything else that's an immunomodulatory and very little that causes any concern. Um, you just hope that we'll eventually find something. You just hope that that microorganism is not something that uh, frightens people too much, but uh, we don't control that. So, um, you know, pretty far along. That gives us a fair amount of confidence. And uh, AZ is now over 2,000 patient years. And as I said, next year, they'll be following with over 3,000 patient years in controlled studies. So you're going to find things that even has, have as low an incidence as 0.5% in the population, but so far so good. Very good. The $16 billion market, how big do you think this product could be? Whatever I say will be wrong. I've never, I've been doing this for almost 35 years and I've never uh, been within 10% of a forecast yet. Of course, I join a long list of folk in the industry that uh, that's true of. Uh, at least I know that I don't know. Um, I will say that uh, of the of the TNF inhibitors, which we're now in the fourth and beginning to be fifth generation, it's hard to find any of them that have been introduced serially that haven't been at least a billion dollar product, and the market is so vast uh, that that's what most people are forecasting. And um, if you look at most of the buy side, they look at numbers that start at billion, billion and a half and scale up, but uh, it's, it's a large drug and it gets embarrassing because you can be wrong by a lot, so we'll just leave it at that. But the category is a large one with some extraordinarily large brands. And if it truly does fit in early therapy, which is where it's been studied and shown to be effective, um, it will be worth writing home about. What of uh, the earlier stage pipeline is exciting to you? What are some of the more exciting candidates there? Well, the earliest in is the other form of sick inhibitor, which we own 100% of, which is uh, in trials for asthma. We have shown thus far, in fact, this was presented just a few weeks ago at the American Thoracic Society, that in challenge trials of asthmatics, which are trials where you take asymptomatic patients who do have asthma, and you literally, uh, in a study that I wouldn't volunteer for, uh, skin test them and see what they're allergic to, then put them in an airflow control room and increase the concentration of that antigen in the air that they're allergic to until they get a bronchospasm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that rather dramatic type of study we showed uh, results that were comparable in what's called late allergic response, that that occurs several hours later, to the market standards, which are the inhaled steroids these days. Uh, interesting thing was, we also showed an effect as early as 15 minutes, no steroid works for hours. So there's an interesting opportunity there that um, the, we may be able to use it and see the difference even in mild to moderate asthmatics well before you get to some sort of extreme challenge like this in terms of seeing a effect that they can feel um, that maybe can reduce some of the use of rescue inhalers and the like as well as producing the same sort of causal um, uh, reduction in inflammation that is the hallmark of the disease and what causes the disease to start with. Right now, there's a lot of bronchodilators used with, with the, the steroids. Many physicians have said for as long as I can remember, certainly 30 plus years, to the patients that they just take the steroids, they wouldn't get the bronchospasms or as many, but they don't because they can't feel anything. And um, so they use varying act activities of bronco, uh, beta-2 agonists and the like, which both the FDA and the EMEA and all regulatory bodies tend to not like, but what choice do you have at this point? So we'll see, but we have hard data based on FEV1, which is a, which is a measurement of lung volume that shows we produce exactly the same results as the steroids, but, make, but much quicker with a simple inhaler. So we've now moved from those challenge studies, as important as they are to prove the mechanism, they don't tell you much about practically how useful it is in a mild, moderate population. 
So now we've started enrolling uh, mild moderates, several hundred of them, and uh, we'll be using it when, while they do have mild disease, they're also not maintained well enough on the existing agents. We'll treat a few hundred of those and we should see some results uh, in the first half of next year. If it works in chronic asthma to prevent the exacerbation of the responses or decreases the frequency, that's also a very big market and um, we'll see what we see next year. What phase is, is the product in? Two. And what is the strategy if you hit good phase two results? If it's a good phase two results in a broad section of the market, which mild moderates can be, then we'll probably partner it because those studies are equally large to the RA studies and thousands of patients many years and uh, we'll need one of the existing pulmonary players, one of the big guys, not, not just somebody that donates pulmonary, but uh, to just even afford it. If it's a niche market, we have no problem with taking it forward and luckily we can afford it. What, um, can you talk a little bit about your balance sheet and what can investors expect with regard to cash burn this year? We ended last year at about a quarter of a billion dollars in cash, so fairly luxurious for biotech. Nothing ever stays the same. Um, um, but uh, we ended last month at in close to between 225 and 230 million. Uh, we've got enough cash on hand doing all the programs that you mentioned earlier uh, that we have in the clinic to last us well into 2014. Not get out of 2014, but for biotech, that's that's impressive. That's a pretty good. Uh, Pretty good situation. Uh, we feel lucky at any rate. And uh, so we don't need to raise money anytime soon, and we don't need to raise money based on desperation. Um, we can afford to do the only thing I've ever seen work, which is let the market tell us when to raise money. So uh, I think we're in pretty good shape with that, but uh, you never know. True. So last question, uh, what are the key events that investors should look for with regard to your stock and drivers that, are, uh, that could impact the value? Drivers in the next several months are mostly inside baseball sort of things, which really appeal to some people and others can't stand it. Uh, but they are such things as a number of these trials progressing and visibly so because they're being reported on at various meetings and the like. I think in terms of results that affect a filing or a claim, um, the earliest you could possibly see anything is ACR this fall, and which will certainly have some data. It won't be the bone data but we'll have some. Then moving into spring to mid-year next year, we'll have quite a bit of data on the actual finished phase threes. And at some point they'll have the bone data. It's up to AZ when they decide to release that. It's not up to us, but they've indicated, as I said, that they intend to file with the FDA in third quarter. So my guess is either proximal with that or just before it or just after it. And they've got two pretty good choices in ULAR, which is just before it, which is a European Society of Rheumatism and or ACR this fall. So uh, somewhere in that time period, they'll do that. Further, I think uh, even for AZ, it's a material event. So whenever it makes its way into upper management from biostatistics, they probably will do a top line release as Pfizer did at a similar stage. So all that's next year, not this year, but it's such a, formal, uh, it's such a formidable transformative event. I've already noticed even this week here in New York, people starting to make bets around what's going to happen. So it's, it is what it is. It's, that's the part of the market I've never gotten. The sort of second, third derivative of how other people will react to things. I'm, I'm better off sticking with the operations. But uh, I think that uh, it's nice to have a potentially major drug finishing up phase three and major data coming up uh, over the course of the next six months and a year. And in the meantime, we've got uh, some pretty important data to us on four other diseases and four other different molecules, some of which aren't even treated at this day and age. So uh, quite a few things. Uh, I kind of doubt that anyone will pay attention to anything but the RA data, even though we may care about the uh, asthma and uh, various lupus and, and, and other indications. Excellent. Well, Jim Garra from, from Rigel, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for your time.